The recording has started. Excellent. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Naomi Rayfield Griffith. I'm Senior Policy Advisor with the Division of Financial Regulation at Oregon DCBS. Uh, this is our rulemaking advisory committee for a uh, couple of rule changes we're looking um, and one new rule. Well, one rule we're amending, two new rules we're hoping to adopt. Um, and all this is related to implementation of Senate Bill 192, which is sort of the uh, pharma pharmaceutical transparency bill that made it all the way through the process this past legislative session. Uh, so we're going to go through those things in turn. Um, rather than kind of do a formal roll call, I'm going to note the official RAC members that we have present from my list. Uh, and then I'm going to take note of the organizations which I appear to be missing uh, people who indicated that they would be attending um, just so that there's not too much crosstalk, et cetera. So my official list, I have uh, Prime Therapeutics. So Lugina, Lugina Mendez Harper is here for Prime Therapeutics, representing one of our PBMs. Have uh, Jen Baker from uh, Cigna representing insurer, representing one of our insurers. Uh, Scott White from Moda Health representing another insurer. Mary Ann Cooper from Cambia representing an insurer. Uh, Kevin Russell representing the Oregon State Pharmacy Association. Dari McGrew representing Pharma. Uh, Ann Murray representing uh, Bristol Myers Quip, one of our pharma manufacturers. Uh, and Charlie Fisher representing Osberg. Uh, we also officially have the National Multiple Sclerosis Society uh, was uh, Seth Greiner had responded, but he is not in the room. Do we have somebody else from the National Multiple Sclerosis Society or? Hi, Numi. This is Seth. I am in the room, oh. not on video today. I'm here observing. Thank you so much Excellent. for allowing the MS Society to observe this process and follow mm -hmm. the rulemaking through the process. Thank you. Great. Great. Well, glad you're here. Uh, I guess I'm looking at an incomplete list. That's my problem. Uh, there you are. OK. <laughs> So if I got anything wrong about uh, how uh, wh who's here and how they would like to be participating, you know, generally we want to have one person per organization who is an official RAC member, but as many people from any organization are welcome to attend as interested parties. So that's kind of how we're doing things. So it sounds like we have our group that I was expecting. Uh, so I'll go ahead and move forward. Uh, so there's several rule changes we're going to be talking about today. And let me share. Da, 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 da. From my extra computer here. Uh, window. And I want to share. OK, cool. Um, so I want to start off kind of discussing probably the least interesting rule change that we're looking at. Um, so one of the sort of aspects of 192 is a change to the way that uh, we collect insurer reports. Um, so as it's currently structured, we collect data annually from insurers on drug pricing from those insurers that uh, file as part of the rate filing process. And so that is basically ACA rate filing. So that's small group and individual, which as I think all of you are aware is a pretty small chunk of the overall uh, insurance uh, purchasing population. Um, so one of the big changes that was made in 192 is that rather than just applying as part of the rate review process, instead we're going to have the same information reported to us to the drug price transparency program uh, for all insurers who are offering health benefit plans in the state. Um, so there's kind of two halves to implementation here. This is kind of the first half we're talking about, um, which is related to how the rule is implemented right now. Um, is currently uh, we implemented the requirement from the original 2018 House Bill 4005 by writing the drug price transparency reporting that is required from insurers into our existing rule for binder filing. So this rule, which is 8360530473, includes all the materials that need to be filed as part of a rate filing application during our annual rate review process. 
Um, because we're no longer going to be applying this only to those insurers, a so small group and uh, individual, we're looking to kind of pull that text out of this rule and then put slightly modified text into a new rule caption. So what I'm showing here is just the sort of chunk of 8360473. We're looking to amend. So this is going to be one of the rules that we change is that we are going to be deleting a uh, subsection uh, I, uh, which is kind of all those chunks that are related to the prescription drug transparency reporting. Are there any questions or comments about this? Should be the most straightforward aspect. Jen, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Numi. So my question is, now that we're applying to all insurance, I assume you mean all fully insured. Is that correct? Yes, um, okay. and I'll get that a little bit into that a little bit more in the sort of new draft rule language as to the scope that we're looking. But no, yeah, we're I'm not looking, looking at that too. And it just says like an insurer with two hundred more enrollees. Yeah. So there, but there is a. Back. I don't want to sidetrack us. Okay. I'll, 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 sorry. I didn't want to. Okay. Thank you. You're fine. No, 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 no. You're <laughs> fine. That's, uh, that, that's why I invited you to us uh, to ask the hard questions. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, um, so any, yeah, Charlie, go ahead. Um, I, I just, I guess this is more of a question. Um, so I, I just wanting to make sure that removing the reporting requirements as part of the rate review process it, that it won't actually impact any of the ability of DCBS and DFR to you know look at the impacts of prescription drugs on rates and you know we obviously have an interest in that so just want to get clarity on how this if at all would impact the the actual rate filing process for uh the insurance plans that are part of that yeah, uh, thanks for the question, Charlie. Um, I, I, I mean, my thought on that is we don't think it will have an impact on that. Um, and that is simply because kind of, OK, so we've collected these as part of rate rate filing materials historically. But ultimately, that's not something that our actuarial team who's doing that work or the sort of life and health program team that's working on rate filings and communicating back and forth with the carriers who are required to file rates like, like they don't look at the drug pricing stuff it's kind of like okay well we get these spreadsheets we hand them off to dpt dpt does their thing so really it's going to be the same <laughs> except we're not kind of uh, we're not putting a square peg in a round hole anymore um which you know is kind of where it is right now is that uh rate filing is a bit of a round hole. We have the square peg we're putting into it. And it's like the rate filing team is like, well, I have this round hole. I can't do anything with the square peg. So they hand it over to the people who have the square hole, which is DPT. I probably went too far with that metaphor. I apologize. Um, but that's kind of where we're at. We don't really think it's going to, it, it's not going to have a meaningful change. Um, and like, it's been something where we haven't even always strictly required the filing of drug price stuff with the binder um, just for various reasons. It hasn't worked out that way, so we'll ask carriers to submit it later. It, it's we're taking it out of a process where it never really made sense for it to be in the first place. So hopefully that it. helps get some yeah. perspective. I was going to say I appreciate the consistency of the metaphor, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's helpful. And yeah, thanks for that context. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I, I can feel that you are all dying to see my draft rule text, so let's go ahead and move to that because uh, I don't think there is any anticipated problems with kind of deleting this from uh, this, the current place. So this is our uh, draft rule uh, for the insurer reporting component. Um, and what we are looking to do with this is kind of OK, so we're pushing out to the sort of whole range of our jurisdiction, so state regulated health benefit plans. So we want to push this out to get mainly large group as kind of the big thing that we're looking at. Um, there is uh, one carrier that has historically been 
Uh, there, there are two carriers who have historically been voluntarily filing large group with us for uh, the uh, for the drug price transparency things. Those are so that's something that where we've had a bit of that data, but just for sort of overall consistency, you know, it's going to be useful for us to push this out to uh, a wider scope in the marketplace. So what we've tried to do here is kind of put a reasonable limit on what we're looking to collect. Uh, while at the same time uh, uh, also pushing it out to get everything that we we wanted to with this change in the law, and at the same time continue collecting data from certain companies that have been filing report in the past since it's kind of like, it, depending on how we defined thresholds, it was possible that some of our smaller insurers would kind of drop out of this because uh, there was definitely an interest in having a population threshold internally. Um, and some of the most interesting data that we've gotten for DPT has been from those small insurer reports because there's, you can really see a clear impact of a small patient population with a very high cost drug, what that does to uh, a single insurer's spend. So that's been useful information that we want to still be able to collect and we want to have, be able to look at historical trends. So we don't want to lose anybody that we've been collecting from in the past. So how I'm going to go through this is I'm going to kind of walk through the structure of the rule um, and then try and get to discussion after that. If people have comments on specific things uh, or questions about the overall, so I'll, I'll kind of go through the rule first and then uh, I'll open it up for discussion. So uh, this kind of bottom half, so the A, B, C, D, like all of that is stuff that was from the old rule. So that's stuff that we basically cut out of uh, 8360473 and we've pasted over into this new rule. This new rule we're expecting is going to be under 836053. Again, that is the subchapter which is related to uh, which is related to health benefit plans. So it is our section of OARs which apply only to those things which are called health benefit plans under Oregon statute, which is a pretty specific definition. Um, and uh, so, so all that's the same. Um, so the new stuff is basically the subsection one and two. Uh, for one, for subsection one, we put in a definition. Insurer means a licensed insurance company, healthcare services contractor, or health maintenance organization that issues health benefit plans in this state. Uh, what I've kind of done here is I've taken a statutory definition, uh, which I believe is seven from 743B005, which is the code section related to health benefit plans, which defines a health benefit plan in a sort of fairly limited way. And this is a term that we've used to kind of get to what are the health plans we have jurisdiction over um, generally. So that's gonna be you know, all of you are fully insured in all the different uh, group sizes, plus uh, association trusts and MUAs uh, with multiple employer welfare arrangements. Um, and I've basically what I've done is rewrite that definition from 743B005 without including associations, trusts, or MUAs. I've just said kind of the things that we conventionally think of as insurers. So that is, you know, uh, licensed insurance company. So that would be, you know, Cigna. Uh, I, I'm completely blanking this moment right now. Cigna, <laughs> Cigna, Aetna, United, et cetera. Uh, a healthcare services contractor, so that would be Kaiser and Providence. Um, a health maintenance organization, which is, just Kaiser under Oregon law. Uh, and I've excluded association trusts in the US, which are also listed in that definition, and specifically because we want to exclude those as this is written. Um, yeah, Marianne, I see you've got a hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, Numi, I'm sorry. I thought I had the answer and then I got a little lost. So I just want to clarify that I have the answer. So yes. the definition of insurer using there would just, by um, your estimation, only pull in fully insured lines of business to report. Okay. Yes. Just and that checking. Is, Thank you. Yes. Yes. That is because we're looking to health benefit plan. Uh, and maybe that is something that I should look at 
clarifying is adding the statutory reference reference there um, is to say we are looking to chapter 743B. Uh, it, it is a little bit uh, a little bit uh, janky uh, in that it, it, it is that I am recite would be recycling the definition while also referring to something else that is defined in the same statute. Um, so it is a little bit troublesome, but basically what I'm looking to do is get to fully insured and excluding, uh, excluding association trusts in the US. Yeah, Jen, go ahead. Thanks, Nubi. Um, so I'm uh, Jen Baker, Cigna Express Scripts. Um, I just wanted to understand why are you excluding association trusts and MIWAs? And, yeah, and, and I'm not I, I, like that is a genuine question. I don't care one way or the other. I'm just curious. Um, so I I think like it's partially an administrative thing. Um, that okay. you know we're we do technically regulate health plans that are issued by association trusts and MUAs, but they, it's not a huge chunk of the market. And really kind of what we're most interested in is the sort of getting, pull, pushing out to the full scope of large group here is so not, what we'd really like to do. Not to go too far in the weeds here. <laughs> yes. But um, what about non-ERISA AS like self-funded plans, for example, CIS, which is the city counties. So they are technically a quasi-governmental agency, right? So they're regulated still by the state, but they are like a separate entity. They are a separate, um, it's, you know, I wouldn't call them an association, um, but yeah. Well, maybe, maybe they are a trust. I, you know, I, I don't know the actual definition of that, but I'm just trying to think of those quasi non ERISA mm -hmm. ASOs, mm -hmm. like ERISA ASO, obviously off the table. Yes. And then my other question is, <laughs> are you going to ask any ERISA self funded to opt in? I think, um, I don't recall if we've asked for opt in in the past. Um, okay. like, like it has been kind of something where we've we've asked for everything. We've asked for Medicaid, PEB, OAB, large group, small group, individual is kind of the way that we've got that spreadsheet structured. In practice, mm -hmm. you know, we get individual, small group, and there's a couple of carriers who voluntarily given us uh, PEB, OAB, large group. Um, so, and I would leave that up to the program team as to whether there's interest in kind of getting getting to self-insured in some way, but obviously we can't compel production of self-insured. Yeah, Regina, go ahead. Sorry, is my hand up? <laughs> I I apologize. I was trying to figure out how to do that. Um, just one question. Um, this is the insurer section, so I, I will defer to the to the insurer um, folks. But I'm wondering, because you're making reference to that 743B definition that sounds like it has those other entities, the MIWAs and associations, I'm wondering if it might be helpful after the end, after the at the end of section one that you have now, if it would be helpful to say for purposes of this subsection, this definition does not include um, self-insured associations, MIWAs, or something, just so to be super clear that even because you're using that definition that has all that, but that's not what you're willing to include. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. OK, no, I appreciate that. Um, and that's certainly something we can look at because like, like my sort of read is like, I don't think that's included uh, right now, but, uh, you know, Play, like certainly trying to get to clarity. It, 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 I, I would like the rule to be clear as to what it means. And if that is something that could help with that, like that's definitely something I can look at drafting. I, uh, I just thought since it, it would it would also be an opportunity to to put in that it's not the self-funded plans. Yes. Because I think that was a question everybody had. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. No, and, and we don't think 192 gives us scope to get go that far. So I, 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 I don't think that should be an issue. Yeah, Daria. Hey, thank you, um, Daria McGrew Pharma. Um, this comment applies to both of these. But I'll just put it in now and reiterate um, in the secondary one. Um, we 
generally appreciate greater transparency on the entire supply chain. I can't, it's my job to say that. Um, second, uh, I think there would be, it would be beneficial to have a definition of rebate. It, that's why I'm saying this applies to both sections. I think um, that the state might want to be very, very clear or um, more broad in how you're defining rebate, price concessions, discounts. Um, there is a shift in the marketplace in the last few years to rename things, change, change ter changing terminology. More things are, are fees instead of rebates. Um, and so there may be a need to capture more of that or be consistent because what we've seen in um, in some other states and, and possibly here in Oregon as well is um, different plans or different PBMs are are not consistent between them in what is being reported as a rebate or not, and that just creates variability in your data. So would like would like that to be considered, and we will submit a, a, that in formal writing after this meeting. Okay, thank you, Daria. Uh, I'll take that. I, I will I will certainly uh, consider that and take that back to our program staff and discuss whether there'd be interest in. Uh, clarifying the definition around rebates and price concessions. Uh, Jen, yeah, go ahead. Um, just to follow up on that, any definition of rebates or price concessions should remain consistent with any other definitions that are, are put into statute elsewhere. But um, what I raised my hand for was actually to go back to, you know, when we were talking about whether it includes self-funded or associated trusts, whatever it may be, um, the clarity is important, not necessarily for right now, but for like five years down the road when maybe like there's been a lot of turnover at like an insurer or something like that. And they're just going to read this right now and they're going to say anything over 200 or more, right? They're not going to understand that it's, it excludes uh, ERISA or they're not going to, you know, and, and, and I'm just trying to also save you guys the headache of having some new kid come on and be like, you can't force ERISA. And you're like, well, we're not forcing ERISA. You know what I mean? Like, Let's just make it clear now so that it's not a confusion down the road um, when people are just reading it at face value. Okay, thank you for that as well. Um, I'm just going to mention kind of, I, I, I said I would wait for discussion until I got through my explanation and then I got halfway through my explanation before I opened it up for discussion. So uh, I'll just, so subsection two, kind of what we're doing there. Uh, most of this language is recycled from the old rule. Uh, the new stuff is the due date and the uh, 200 or more threshold. Um, kind of the things that I'll mention, there's one thing that I've mentioned here is that the program team uh, asked for a change in the sort of due date in the draft. They wanted it to be at May 1 instead of May 15, and I didn't get that into this draft. So that is one change that I'm already looking to make to this. Uh, just to kind of talk about the sort of 200 or more enrollees thing. Um, we had, they, there's definitely kind of an interest in keeping the scope of this reasonable uh, and kind of the way that we have worked towards this is by looking at some of our enrollment data that we have from past uh, data calls to uh, kind of look at, okay, what, what do we capture? What do we lose if we exclude something? Um, and so the sort of 200 number is a threshold that we hit on that uh, is below. So above 200, we have most of our sort of small carriers who've historically been reporting uh, in the uh, small small group and individual already. Uh, and kind of below that, you have sort of your alphabet soup of associations, trusts, and MUAs, and companies which have which are reporting, you know, five or six enrollees between between uh, uh, between zero and 150 enrollees in Oregon. And the way that those uh, reports have come in is, you know, not always consistent. Um, so we're really kind of looking at the 200 threshold based on what we know about our overall population is that that's going to be something like 99.8 percent of covered lives and large group, individual, small group. Um, which is really what we're looking to get to. Um, so there's not a whole lot of additional juice for the squeeze from going below 200. 
Uh, but if we go much higher than 200, then we're losing some of our smaller, smaller carriers who we have historical data from, and we really want to keep those in there. Um, so that's kind of where that's at. Uh, the sort of um, rub on this is that by setting it at 200, we do capture uh, a couple of sort of oddball organizations. And the one that I would note is this uh, entity called uh, Timber Products Manufacturers Trust, which is the only MUA currently operating and offering health plans in the state of Oregon um, that we don't really interact with them very much, uh, that there is a working relationship in so far that they file required disclosures with us every year, but we don't actually interact with them beyond that. Uh, and the sort of thought of, well, is there value in kind of trying to get more data from this entity that has 700 covered lives between between 400 and 700 covered lives, depending on the quarter you're looking at? Uh, the judgment was like, we didn't think that that was worth uh, trying to pursue. So that's why I've excluded MUAs from the definition specifically and those other oddball entities is that we're, you know, really trying to get out our fully insured. That's the sort of core data set that we're looking to get to and that kind of the uh, oddball entities are not what we're looking to reach in this, at least not right now. Um, I think theoretically, because the definition in 192 points to health benefit plans, you know, we could reach that um, if we just pointed it back to the uh, definition as written in 743B005, but that's where we're at right now. Yeah, Marianne, go ahead. Yeah, um, two questions slash comments on this section. Um, so one, I don't know that it's clear in there that it means for the prior year, although I I think it does mean for the prior year, but it might be helpful to say that. And then just wanted to let you know that by May 1st or May 15th, our rebate amounts would still be kind of in an estimated phase. We wouldn't have finalized numbers until much closer to toward the end of the year. Um, and so I feel like we'll just need clear instruction on what to do in terms of estimations if you want to stick with a May date or be able to look later in the year if you want more finalized numbers. Yeah, no, I appreciate that perspective. And that's definitely something we've struggled with a little bit, being aware of that we know that rebates are often often very delayed from the transaction and that kind of full getting that full reconciliation, it takes quite a while. Um, so there that that is kind of the pressure pushing towards a later date. But at the same time, it's the insurer data has been some of the most interesting and most useful data. I think that DPT has ended up collecting that gets the most interesting narrative that we can tell in our annual report in terms of pointing at, you know, this is what this is actually costing consumers. This is what it's actually costing the state. Um, and so we need time to actually analyze what we bring in. So that's kind of the balance is like having that runway from when we get our spreadsheets in and uh, finalized to putting the report out in December uh, while also being balanced against, okay, acknowledging rebates aren't fully reconciled until pretty late in the year. So that, that that's where that uh, that's at. Um, I, I I think May is probably uh, a number pretty close to the hearts of my program team colleagues. So uh, I I don't think we'll move it from there. Uh, so, but I appreciate that feedback. No, Numi, I think that's fine. I think we just would need to know what what you'd want in terms of like estimations or and and you know I do think it's extra work if we end up having to reconcile. Like once we do get final numbers versus, you know, I know it's not ideal to hold out till till later, but just hopefully an easy as possible process around around that discrepancy. I don't have like a a hand a solution to hand you right now, unfortunately, but just wanted to flag that that it will be very much estimates and and there will be a workload associated with like if we have to, you know, true those up or something at the end of the year. No, I appreciate that. Uh, any other discussion on the draft insurer rule? I'm just taking some notes here so I can think ahead as to what I'm doing. 
And maybe I just got another chat from Antoinette and I'll credit her with the good idea. Also, maybe something that just says like this period's excluded or like what's known and what's not known at the time we file versus making estimates might also be a way to handle it. OK, um, let's see. So I've got comment on the due date and I am planning to move it for to May 1 for our program team folks, but I will take back about the uh, sort of the incomplete data issue. Um, I've got comments that are kind of encouraging being a little bit more explicit about the exclusions. So that's something that I'll take a look into uh, whether I can amend that language to make it more clearer. Um, I had comments kind of directing towards uh, clarifying the definition of rebates, um, rebates, price concessions, et cetera. Um, so that's certainly all something I'll take back to our DPT and PDAB folks and see if there's uh, thoughts about that. Uh, and I got had a comment about clarifying that we're pointing back to the previous calendar year. Um, so I'll, I, I, I do understand that. Uh, I think. Uh, I feel like I put that in a previous draft and maybe it got <laughs> knocked out in, in in the wash of review. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at that as well. Uh, was there anything that I missed? Uh, Regina, go ahead. Well, I was just going to point out um, the one that you showed just a, uh, a minute ago where you're crossing out the stuff. It does have a little language in it that says for the experience period covered in the filing. So that might have been where the little like time frame was and it makes sense why you took it out, but um, that might help. <laughs> no, that makes sense. Uh, the original role. Thank you, Lucina, for the keen eyes. Uh, did I miss anything in terms of changes that people would be interested in seeing to the draft rule? OK. Uh, and you will have time to write me all sorts of fancy letters with lots of words in them to uh, to remind me of all those things as well. So the, uh, the there are more bites at the apple uh, still. Uh, Numi, you know, sorry, yes. while you're on that, did you give a date um, yet uh, oh, for when you want those letters? No. Uh, so I, I have something in my agenda for next steps, so we'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> Making sure I didn't miss anything. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Um, okay. Uh, so let's see. What do we have up? I'm going to go ahead and move on to our PB draft PBM rule. Um, and let's see here. I have finally learned the magic of running two different Teams instances on two different computers and therefore thereby being able to share stuff without losing my screen and all my all in my chat and my population list. It's it's amazing. I, I, I encourage you to try it. Um, sorry, small pleasures in life, I guess. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so PBM rule. Um, uh, da, 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 da. This is our sort of draft language here. Uh, again, I will kind of go through the structure of the rule um, as we have, as I have drafted it, uh, and then open it up for discussion. Um, kind of thoughts on placements in our ORs. Uh, so I have placeholder number. Uh, we are looking at putting this in chapter 836, 200-04. Um, so that's, that will be in sequence after the existing rules which relate to PBM registration. And so basically this connects back to that and that saves me the trouble of writing definitions into this. Um, so that's where this is going to be. Um, we've tried to reflect the um, intent of 192 with respect to the sort of pharmacy benefit manager reporting. Um, and to be able to kind of get close to what we were contemplating in, in, in terms of what we're asking for, because this the, the 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 language for this is very much something that came from the recommendations of our drug pricing team. Um, let me see. So, kind of just to kind of talk about how we viewed 
the structure of 192 is it was really looking to a similar law in Texas, um, which requires sort of reporting of various information related to rebates and how they are allocated. Um, and we viewed that as being basically, OK, four numbers, which is total amount of rebates received, uh, how much is passed on to carriers, how much is passed on to enrollees, how much is passed on, how much is retained as revenue by the PBM. Um, the way that it was drafted in 192, I think is potentially confusing. Uh, so like what I'm really looking to do here is kind of draft something that says, OK, this is how we read this and this is what it was intended to be. Like I look at 192 and I say, OK, this is these are the four numbers that we should be getting out of this. And because we can point to the Texas statute, which has been in operation for two years, um, I can say, OK, that's that's what we modeled this on. That's what we're looking to. So that's that's where this is at. Uh, so sort of moving ahead. Uh, so this would be added to the existing sequence of rules on pharmacy benefit manager registration. Uh, subsection one here uh, is kind of just uh, is the meat of the rule. It's OK. Here's our due date. We've proposed June 1 right now. Uh, the report is sort of just in our language, form and manner. So the sort of intention of the program team is we'll provide a template. You send it back with the numbers filled in, basically. Um, a report needs to contain the following information. I've got A through D listing the four numbers that we're looking for. Uh, so aggregated amount of rebates, fees, price protection payments, et cetera, uh, for uh, related to managing pharmacy benefits for carriers issuing health benefit plans in this state. Uh, and a lot of this is kind of mirroring the language in 192 and just kind of restructuring the way that it's ordered. Uh, aggregate amount of payments passed on to carriers is B. C is aggregate amount of payments as described passed on to enrollees. D is aggregate amount, aggregated amount of payments as described retained as revenue. Subsections two and three are kind of trying to define our expectations around how this works. So subsection two basically says, OK, the uh, amount described in 1A which is total amount should be the same thing as B, C, and D added together. Um, so like what's kept as revenue, what's passed on to patients, what's passed on to carriers uh, should equal total amount of rebates received. And so that's kind of the expectation there. Uh, subsection three is kind of clarifying some of what we want to be counted. Uh, so we're basically looking to say, OK, we want uh, all payments that the pharmacy benefit manager received from manufacturers directly and any payments that the pharmacy benefit manager received from subsidiaries of manufacturers or otherwise affiliated entities. Um, uh, and I think uh, the sort of manufacturers, subsidiaries, I believe that is a mistake on my part in drafting because what re really um, we're looking for is subsidiaries of the pharmacy benefit manager. So that is a mistake in drafting on my part is that we're looking for um, it, this has been an issue that's been percolating for a while, uh, has been that there's been entities that are described as, uh, in some cases, as rebate aggregators and uh, are sometimes described, uh, what are they, group, group purchasing organizations as being sort of umbrella category that those fall within. Uh, it, it's not all group purchasing organizations are rebate aggregators. Rebate aggregator is not a thing that's defined anywhere, but it's kind of something that we've heard about and that there is concern that the use of sort of subsidiary entities could uh, be used to avoid transparency reporting requirements like this by using a third party entity, basically. So that's what that is. Um, so that's one correction that I need to make in this draft is, OK, we're looking for subsidy organizations of PBMs, not of manufacturers. So that's a clarification that I'll make here. OK, uh, that is the rule. Um, is there any questions, comments, discussion on, dra on numbered rule to go in 836-400? Yeah, Seth, go ahead. 
Hi, Numi. Thanks for this again. Great walkthrough and everything. And I'd just like to say that the society appreciates the uh, show of your work and um, cross-checking in points two that will be undertaken. So thank you for that. Other comments? Regina, go ahead. You are still on mute. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, just wanted to say thank you for the June 1st date. I know that was something we talked about during the um, legislative session, you know, and, and that you guys were, you know, very responsive to the fact that rebates happens well after um, the point of sale. So want to acknowledge and thank you for that. Um, and I know that we talked quite a bit about the um, modeling this after the Texas law. One of the questions I wanted to um, or one of the things I wanted to point out in A, um, it talks about the aggregated amount of rebates, fees, price protection payments, and any other payments that the PBM received. So I think um, that that is, I think what Daria might have been mentioning, where it where there it can include like these fees and other things that happen outside of rebates. Um, so I, I think that's covered, but I would just ask. Um, if that could be clarified. And then um, the other question that I had just at is we talked about the GPO thing again during the legislative session, and, and there was a lot of discussion around that because GPOs are used in other parts of the drug supply chain. Like I know um, hospitals, pharmacies can use GPOs as well. So um, I thought that that concept had been kind of um paused as something that the drug price transparency board was interested in until we kind of got our hands around how gpos are used throughout the drug supply chain so i just was curious if you could give us a little background on number three yeah um i mean i think part of where we landed with the gpo uh conversation in session um, and that's not something the department ever asked to be removed from the language. Um, it's kind of like, okay, so there was 404 and there was 192. 404 was kind of the vehicle for the PDAB uh, recommendations. 192 was the vehicle for uh, the uh, recommendations of the drug price transparency program a little bit more. Um, and kind of the, that was more the agency bill originally and the way things balanced out okay so we had pbm reporting that's basically the same structure the sort of four numbers structure in both bills uh 404 died uh in committee um and it had the gpo language in it 192 was drafted without it in there um and, and so like we didn't ask for that to be put in originally um I, I i don't recall exactly where it came from i know that there's been a lot of interest sort of in the idea of rebate aggregators and whether we're getting the full picture on things and this is really something we're looking to uh get to uh one thing that i did look to in drafting that subsection three is the texas regulations implementing uh and maybe i'll go back and take another look at how they drafted things um, but there is a regulatory expectation set in Texas, Texas regulation, not in the law itself that, okay, we're not looking just for direct payments to PBMs. We're looking to payments to other entities that are owned, controlled, affiliated with PBMs because they're trying to get to that same thing as like, we don't want a situation where a PBM is able to avoid, uh, this reporting requirement by, you know, playing a game of, uh, cops. Uh, and hiding the ball somewhere else. So that that that's certainly the intent there. Um, I, like I think back to the GPO conversation. I I certainly never loved the GPO definition because like, like I think it was potentially confusing. It's something that okay maybe these entities technically are GPOs, but not all entities that are GPOs are going to fall under this, and that's going to cause cause a lot of confusion by throwing a net out that is. Uh, capturing a lot of dolphins along with the fish as it were um sorry i, it's been a I day certainly for... appreciate that <laughs> yeah i certainly appreciate yeah. that i think 
because I thought in when we again when we were talking about um, again we we have in some states where it just says rebates, but I think there was, you know, some real clear intent here to say rebates, fees, price protection payments, and any other payments um, that we receive, that PBMs receive from manufacturers. And I, my understanding was that was the intent. It was, that was very purposeful to make sure that we got all of that stuff and that it wasn't just like, oh, here's the rebates, but it would be all of those payments um, that are received. Um, so again, I I, I certainly I, I actually manage Texas as well. So certainly if there's anything I can help with, I, I don't recall there being anything like number three in Texas, but um, certainly um, it's been a while since I've looked at it. So certainly appreciate it if we could look at that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Daria, you want to go ahead? Yep, just going to say what you know I'm going to say, but first, thank you for the work here. Um, really appreciate uh, the effort put in. Um, again, reiterate my comments that, and uh, agree with Lugina that this is more prescriptive than the other language in the in the plan section, um, but I think that both could still benefit from a definition. Thanks. Thank you, Daria. Charlie. Hello. Um... I wanted to raise something that is not contained in the rules, um, but that, uh, well, is of interest to us and I think good for the program. There's in the statute, or I guess in Senate Bill 192, there's a little bit, at least for my read, ambiguity about what confidential information means um, in relation to. So the, you know, DCBS is going to put a report on their website, including the aggregated data. Um, and it says that they will not disclose confidential information of pharmacy benefit managers. I think that refers to the kind of three pieces, the identity, identity of a carrier, the price charge for a specific drug, or the amount of any rebate or for fee provided for a specific drug. Um, but I guess I'm just a little bit concerned that that ambiguity could allow uh, PBMs to potentially try to classify information in addition to that as classified. And so I'm wondering, I guess, just two thoughts. One, um, you know, would we would it be smart to include in the rule that specifically those are the pieces of confidential information, or that is the definition, and anything other than that is not confidential, or and, and or I guess I'd say, uh, just stating that if a PBM wants to claim that any additional information is confidential, they have to do so ahead of time and provide uh, justification that the DCBS would then um, determine uh, initially whether that is in fact justified or not. I just want to avoid kind of the situation where I know the whole trade secret uh, issue has caused some problems for the broader prescription drug transparency program. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks for that comment, Charlie. Um, if I, I I think kind of our view is that we don't think that anything that we should be receiving in this report would be something we would consider to be confidential. So these four sort of top line numbers that Texas basically publishes um, that we're planning something a little bit we're, we're we're similar. The sort of only difference in approach that I would note is that Texas kind of just does a one page report that reflects the numbers reported aggregated across all their PBMs. Um, we're probably, I, I believe the intent of the program team is to just publish the top line numbers from each PBM that reports, which is about 53 entities in Oregon right now. Um, so that's kind of where that's at. Um, like certainly, you know, that I have the history working on drug price transparency uh, for a good long while uh, now. Uh, so, um, I, I am intimately familiar with the problem of trade secret um, and have very strong opinions about uh, what might be claimed as trade secret by an entity that is, uh, and, and the colorability of that claim as to whether that is reasonable. I don't think it would be reasonable to claim any of these four numbers as trade secret. Um, just, uh, and that's not a legal opinion, but certainly that's that's my feeling, having spent a lot of time thinking about this in the context of drug pricing. So uh, I'll, I'll put that out there. Certainly, like I know the intent of the program team is to basically publish everything we get from this. <laughs> uh, but 
like that's that that is where it's at. Uh, Legina, go ahead. Um, thanks so much. And I, I actually was going to ask um, in Senate Bill 192, um, it does talk about disclosure um, protections, confidentiality, and then the aggregation of all this information. So I was wondering, it, is that not going to be in the rule anywhere or what's what is the plan for that? Let me take a look at my language real quick here. Let's see. Um, and while I while I while you're looking, um, the other thing I just want to follow up on what you had said is that the it sounds like the intent is to print whatever it is that we report, and it sounds like you're anticipating saying you know like Cigna had this, Optum had this, Prime Therapeutics had that. Um, I would just caution you. Um, it, it it does have in here that um, anything that's printed, we don't want to. Um, disclose the carriers or the drug classes. And for prime therapeutics, this is um, unique to us in that as a PBM, we're owned, um, partially owned by Regents. So any of our data that we're reporting is directly attributable to Regents. Whereas like some of the other PBMs um, that are larger have multiple clients within the state. So when they're reporting their numbers, you know that it's say CVS's data, but you don't know that it's X insurer it's not just that one insurer, they have multiple groups. Um, so I just wanted to point that out, that that is something that's unique. Um, if if there is attribution directly to Prime, um, then that can lead to a direct attribution to Regents. Um, so we would want to be cautious with that. Yeah, no, I appreciate that um, comment, Regina. I, I do remember some conversation this fall <laughs> on that subject um, and, and, and kind of thinking about uh, the sort of uniqueness of PBMs that are serving a single carrier and how that kind of looks at. I don't remember exactly where that settled. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think one of the ideas that was brought up is like, OK, we publish by individuated sort of number category, but you know, it would be PBM A, PBM B, PBM C. Um, like um, okay. a, a, a smart person could look at that and probably figure out which one is which uh, based on like other publicly available data, but it would take a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. so, so like that was certainly one option. I know that we do have some of our program staff on here. Uh, Sophie or Ralph, do you remember where we landed on that question? Or Courtney, I don't know who has the best perspective on that. I mean, this is Ralph. I think we'll want to talk about that with the okay. team and probably follow up offline. Thank you. OK, no, I remember that conversation. I don't remember where it landed. So uh, and I appreciate the Gina you bringing up the issue again. Uh, sure. Charlie, it, just, oh, just yeah. as an FYI, it is noted in Senate Bill 192 that we hmm. don't want to have um, the report that discloses the identity of a carrier or an enrollee. So again, that's where I'm getting back to because that's something that's unique to us that we wanted to um, make sure is it, there's some sort of protections there. So thank you. Charlie, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, I, I guess this is just me kind of uh, responding to this idea uh, on first blush, but it seems to me that the a situation like that would be something, or I guess number one, the principle is I think as much information should be as public as as possible, and the statute should be read that way. Um, and to the extent that there are, you know, individual PBMs that through other information one could identify connection to a particular carrier. Um, I, I mean, my thought would be that's just a, you know, that's separate information that is that shouldn't really be took taken into account in relation to the. The way that this particular rule is enacted um and so you know i think just more transparency is better and uh we want to make sure that as many people get as much information as they can about this important issue yeah no thanks charlie um and, and like i do think that some of this information is in some senses already out there as it were because of uh things like drug price transparency reports some of the stuff that we get uh, secondhand, uh, in, in fact, that because we have been collecting 
data on rebate amounts relative to total premium collected and things like that. There are there has been material in last year's report, and I believe will also be in this year's report that is kind of reflecting net rebate amounts by carrier. Um, and you could kind of reverse that engineer reverse engineer that to say, okay, well, I know that such and such carrier primarily uses this this PBM, and they could read it back that way. So uh, there, there's there's a lot of things to think about here. Um, one thing I do want to kind of pull up just real quick, I want to take a look at the statutory language just briefly for a couple things. Let's find my window, SB192. Um, so uh, the, the one, one of the things I wanted to kind of point out is that this uh, language, the rebates, fees, price protection payments, and any other payments comes directly from the statute. Um, so that is one difficulty with uh, defining that basically I've pulled that, put it into the subsection one, and then referred back to subsection one uh, A and all the other ones. So that's kind of where that is from. Um, we do have rulemaking authority in this area, so I, I, I can see potential benefit in trying to nail down that definition a little bit more, but that's definitely something that I'll take back. Uh, let's see, the other stuff, information is confidential, except in subsection five, does not disclose confidential information. Where is the stuff about, oh, there it is. Um, so, the report may not disclose identity of a carrier and really price charged amount of any rebate or fee provided for a specific drug or class of drugs. So yeah, and all that's in the statute. Uh, one thing that we um, try not to do in rulemaking is write rules that we don't need to. Um, and I think the reason why I didn't kind of go into the confidentiality in the uh, rule draft is because I think it's, I think the statute already speaks for itself with respect to what is considered confidential and will or will not be disclosed under uh, this under this rule. Uh, and that really is the interaction of kind of the subsection four and five here. Subsection four being everything that we receive under this section is confidential and not subject to disclosure except as provided. And then uh, aggregated data from all reports filed by pharmacy benefit managers is the thing that we publish. Um, so that's maybe open to interpretation. But I, I think it's relatively clear and that the program team has an intent and an expectation on how they're going to do that, but that's where we're at right now. Uh, uh, uh. Let's see, I have a hand from Antoinette, but I- uh, Can you mean, this is the Antoinette. Yeah. I have yeah, my hands up because uh, I'm sorry. Your RAC member, Marianne, um, representing Cambia, had to oh. drop off. So okay. I, I, I'm i just taking her place temporarily. Uh, for the okay, remainder of the meeting, I am sorry about that. No so I'm assuming, that, I'm assuming that this will be handled um, just like the recent PDAP data call, right? That um, uh, happened, I think, last month where well, all the information collected was on the aggregate level. So insurer information, um, PBM information was, was disclosed. Um, and that that is eventually what um, will be released right publicly. Um, so the insurer PBM if we continue to be confidential. And I'm assuming that is the same sort of uh, route we will take with this um, reporting. Yeah, I, 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 thanks for that, Antoinette. I defer to the uh, program team on kind of thinking about how that is, um, but and, and that is collected under a different statute because I believe that data call was not under our general uh, director's inquiry authority, which has fairly strict uh, disclosure limitations on it unless specifically authorized by the director. So I, I mean, that's something where it's pretty standard for us to keep it under lock and key, you know, and we've got a similar but slightly different structure built into this uh, statute, which is okay. Everything is confidential except for the stuff that we're allowed to publish. Um, so that's uh, where that's at. Um, <laughs> let me see here. I believe that is 
everything I had on that. Are there any other comments, questions, concerns regarding the PBM draft rule? And I'm just going to take down my notes here is I'm making that correction to whose subsidiary or affiliated company we're referring to exactly. Um, what were the other things? Uh, had comments again on definitions of rebates and other payments. Uh, and uh, June 1st is a good date. We landed on that during the session, and that comes straight from the statute. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me just take a look back here. Uh, OK, um, was there anything that I'm missing in terms of things that I should take back to the draft and consider revising? If you could remind me, Regina. <laughs> oh, did I put my hand up? Sorry. No. <laughs> oh, you're just you like, came no, off I mute for a second. I thought maybe you had something to say. <laughs> no, I just just the number three again, just trying to to see if there's something in mm -hmm. that Texas. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. OK, um, so thank you, everybody, for a best discussion on that. Um, and I am 10 minutes ahead of schedule, amazingly. Uh, so uh, this is a public meeting it's covered by public meeting statute. So we have an opportunity for public comment. Uh, are there any members of the public who would like to comment on the draft rule, draft rules or other things that came up in discussion. Just put your hand up and I will call on you. OK, I think that was long enough. Um, thank you to our interested parties who are in the room. Um, so last thing I have on my agenda is discussing next steps. Uh, so I have at least a couple of minor revisions that I'm definitely making, uh, and that is kind of okay. The date in the first one, uh, and then the reference to subsidiary of who in the second one. I'll figure that out uh, and take back the other comments that I noted and uh, discuss with the program team about uh, whether there are adjustments we can make to the rule language. Um, and my plan for this group had been to do a total of two RAC meetings, so this is the first RAC meeting. The second RAC meeting will discuss any changes that have been made to the draft rule. Uh, and we will also discuss the statement of need and fiscal impact. Uh, so that's another thing that I would be interested in hearing back from folks about, uh, particularly in terms of kind of one of the things that we are required to do by law is look into and discuss whether there are impacts to equity as a result of adopting a rule. Uh, as well as if there's fiscal financial impacts uh, on uh, small businesses. Generally, nothing. Uh, generally, the things that we regulate in the program area that I work in are not small businesses. Insurers and PBMs and pharmaceutical manufacturers are mostly not small businesses. But if uh, there are small businesses operating in Oregon who would be impacted by either of these rule changes, I'd was something I would appreciate knowing about in any comment letters that you have. Um, yeah, so that is pretty much the plan that I'll have another RAC meeting scheduled. We'll go over amendments to the rule. We'll go over the sniffy and uh, be good to file. Sort of the general plan is to have this not filed actually this year since we uh, sort of the um, operative reporting dates are in May and June, we're looking to file sort of early next year to have an effective date by May 1, basically, which is the first reporting date. Uh, and we're on track to do that. So um, that's where that's at. Uh, Jen, did you have a question? Sorry, you know what? I do, and I meant to ask it earlier, and I apologize. Um, really quick, do you know, <laughs> this is very bland, um, do you know if the, you guys are going to have a um, like a, a template that you're going to ask uh, PBMs to? Okay. Yes. 
Yeah. Okay. That, that, I, I just would encourage that. I mean, obviously we're not going to put that in rule, but like. Yeah, no, that's it, kind it, of. It ensures consistency and it's really helpful. Yes. Um, and we like that. We like templates too. So um, expect a template. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Most certainly welcome. Uh, Regina, did you have something additional? Yeah, just a quick question process yeah. wise. So I yeah, know yeah, that yeah. it says in the rules like that we're going to submit information on the forms and that, that that the DCBS comes up with. Can you just clarify for me um, with the forms come out sometime next year for us to see, but before May 1st? I believe, yes, okay. yes, definitely before May 1st. Uh, okay. I'm not sure it's how much before I, I have seen a draft. So like there, okay. there, there, there is an object out there that will be finalized at some point, but uh, okay. that's that's not my uh, jurisdiction, so to speak. Um, but it's, but and it's not something that we would talk about during the RAC per se, right? Yeah, no, no. Okay, um, like, like there's, I mean, there's form and manner language in the statute. I put form and manner language in the rule. It's kind of just like, hey, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a template <laughs> is what that you. boils down to. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. uh, where was I? Uh, so one more meeting, um, which will be either December or January. Uh, do we have, we, we don't have a date set yet, Karen. Um, I'll say probably no. January, uh, at some point. That'd be good. Um, so <laughs> good for me. <laughs> good for me. <laughs> Karen is very busy in December. Um, yeah. there, there's a bunch of so, yeah. somebody passed a bunch of laws that required us to make rules. So Five it, rules. It, anyway. Yeah, it could have been so much worse. <laughs> it could have been so yeah. much worse. <laughs> I know. I killed some. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have no responsibility for killing any of those bills. Absolutely not. I take no position on them. Um, so let's see. So we'll get a rack date out to the group once we have one. I expect it to be in January. Um, so what I will say um, is get me any comments that you have back on the draft stuff. Uh, what's today? Today is the 13th. How about Four weeks, uh, December 11. Does that sound good to folks? Um, I'm being generous because I have time. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So you can take take everything that you write down to your lawyers and they can eviscerate it. And you can go back and forth a few times before you get it to me. So lot, 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 lots of lots of leeway. I, I'm getting punchy, I'm sorry. Um, so I will put a note down to myself for the 11th. Any comments you have on the draft rules, um, you know, feel free to reiterate stuff that you brought up. Um, it's helpful for me to have those reminders. Um, and again, interested if there's any small businesses or diversity impacts that anybody thinks of, I would be interested to know about those. Uh, let's see, anything else? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, that'll be it. Uh, I'll get get me comments by the 11th to be considered. Uh, I'll try and get a draft together mid December. I've used all my vacations, so I'll be actually working through the holidays for the most part. Um, and get you back any revisions and the draft sniffy at least a week in advance of whenever the next meeting ends up being. Sound good? All right. Nodding heads. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Yumi. <laughs> Appreciate all your work on this. Thank you. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks all. Uh, so we'll Take go care, ahead honey. and adjourn. <laughs>